Good morning. It's Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, it is Friday, January 15th, 2021, and we're meeting via Zoom. Uh, many of you may be watching this on YouTube, and that's great. And the issue today is um, S-18, which is an act relating to uh, good time, uh, which is a uh, process whereby offenders are able to earn time off of their sentences through good behavior and um, probably should be a better word than good time. Um, and uh, maybe we can... Earn time. Yeah, uh, earn time might be better because I don't I think that it has connotations that uh, aren't intended and, and does uh, is somewhat offensive to some victims, I'm sure. So with that, um, I turn it over to our first witness this morning is Sarah Robinson, who has to leave um, by 9.15, but I don't think we'll be more than, we don't think we'll be 45 minutes. But Sarah, thank you for your patience and holding out your originally scheduled uh, earlier in the week. Thank you for having me. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Good to see you all this morning. Um, and thanks again for the opportunity to say a few words on the Earned Good Time program and the language that you're considering today. I just wanted to, to um, as a, a brief bit of history, the Vermont Network, we didn't serve on the original committee which developed the legislative recommendations for the Good Time Law that was passed last year. Um, although we certainly have been engaged in related and broader conversations about victims' rights and criminal justice reform efforts. And in almost all cases, we believe that these are complementary efforts um, that just require some careful balancing. And in concept, uh, we're very supportive of earned good time. As you've heard from other witnesses, we do believe that incentives play an important role in encouraging growth and change in people who are incarcerated. Uh, we think that's a good thing, and that an earned credit time is, is one way to achieve this, um, or earned time program is one way to achieve this. But as you, as you heard from uh, Chris Fenno and the Attorney General earlier in this week, since the legislature passed and enacted um, this law last session, we've heard from victims all across the state with real concerns about the one-size-fits-all approach to the applicability of good time to individuals serving sentences for every possible crime. And uh, we very much understand that the state's previous good time program was overly complex. It relied on the discretion of DOC staff and ultimately led to disparities and inaccuracies. So um, very much support the intention to move to a system that removes discretion about good time accrual and promotes a more simplified approach. But we do agree with the Attorney General's office that for certain crimes um, where there is a death resulting and for the worst forms of sexual violence, that the impact mm -hmm. on victims and surviving family members of those crimes ought to be given weight um, in the state's good time program. And so to, to this end, we, we support the, uh, the language that you are considering today. And I, I wanted to also lift up a second concern um, that's not necessarily addressed in this language, um, but that's related to victim rights and notification um, related to earned good time. And this past uh, last year, we, we testified at length in House Corrections and Institutions about the importance of a victim-centered notification process for earned good time. And you do see a requirement that the Department of Corrections um, notify victims at the onset of the program uh, about, about the new statute. Um, but we've heard really major concerns from victims about the plans that the Department of Corrections has uh, to, uh, for its, the notification process. I'm sure you can hear more about that from, from the Department of Corrections, but both the frequency and the mode of the notifications that the department plans to use. Um, and our, under, our current understanding is that the notification plans would require an opting in 
um, to all notifications related to this or an opting out of all notifications on behalf of victims. And we would love to see some additional options available to victims in terms of um, how they hear about um, earned time accrual um, and when they hear about earned time accrual. Um, and on victim notification, I wanted to address something that Senator Baruth raised in the discussion earlier this week about um, moving forward, victims being notified about the potential impact of earned time on sentences. And, and we are concerned that there is currently no standard process in place for prosecutors communicating the impact of earned good time to victims when potentially seeking their input on plea agreements or um, informing them of the status of sentencing conversations. And there's no required notification to victims about um, the potential impact at the sentencing phase. Um, and we do feel that victims deserve the right to be informed at this stage of the process about the potential impact of good time on a sentence so they can be prepared really for an accurate length of incarceration. Their expectations can, can match um, what is possible. Um, and when sentences are finalized, it often provides this sense of closure for a given period of time for victims to heal. Um, so we would ask that the committee consider including language um, in the proposed bill to ensure that this notification does take place around sentencing. This is also an important moment for victims because that's the place where they're able to offer a victim impact statement. So we feel like that would be um, helpful language to include. Um, and with that, I am happy to take any questions that you might have. I guess I have two questions and one is the the way the language is structured, those who would be sentenced after the effective date of the bill leave it sentence, not convicted, but uh, sentenced, um, would um, have an opportunity to um, petition for receiving or in good time. And um, wouldn't that involve the victim as well? We just talked about victim notification. I'm sure the victim's concerns would be taken into account if the offender petitioned to receive good time. If they didn't petition under the under the way this is drafted, they'd have the normal import that they have at a trial, but the person wouldn't be eligible for good time. So I'm a little, if you put your language in, I'm not, I'm not sure where it goes. Maybe it's part of a petition. petition. Yeah, I think at, at a minimum, I think ensuring that victims have input in that petition process would, would satisfy that. Because um, yeah. if that they need. didn't petition, they wouldn't be eligible for the good time. So, mm -hmm. you know, good time. Um, the second question uh, pertains to that same. We have a, a subset of people who were convicted uh, prior to January 1, 2021 who are now eligible for to earn good time moving forward. They're not getting it retroactively, and I'm not sure that that message has got out to any of it, um, that it's not retroactive. That was one of the discussions we had last year when we passed the bill. So I, I, I hope that there's not confusion about that part of it, um, that it, that it, best, they would only be receiving it moving forward if this bill doesn't pass. I think there is why a uh, good understanding about that among victims. I think initially there were some questions, but I think um, at least the victims we've heard from fully understand that um, the good time accrual only began after the law um, came into effect. What I will say is that um, it still has the potential, obviously, to change sentences that um, no. you know, over time. And so it, I think for some victims, it felt like they had a promise around a certain length of sentence and that um, that promise had been um, changed and there was concern about that. Um, but the other, I guess the other more question, I've divided this into two separate groups. One is those that are sentenced after the effective date of this bill. 
I'm worried that we, because everybody would know what the good time is, it would be back the way it was years ago when everybody was eligible for it. Um, and should we just do, um, have it effective for that small, the smaller group that have, um, had not been earning a good time and are eligible starting this January 1st and, and not, and, and just focus on that group. Since everybody know what the rules of the game are in any new Moving sense. forward. Moving forward. Um, I, you know, I, I will defer to uh, the attorney general's office and attorneys on that and yeah. whether that poses any legal, um, legal concerns, but it would certainly simplify um, the program and the expectations for victims, I do believe. Yeah. Okay, other questions for Sarah? Sarah, thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. Our next witness is Matthew Valerio, Governor General. Morning, Matt. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, you know, as I had expressed on other occasions regarding the potential for this bill, um, it's obviously some backtracking from what the work that had been done with uh, Justice Reinvestment Two and um, the proposal that was brought originally by the Department of Corrections to uh, reinstitute good time after a decade of not having it and the pressures that that put on other methods of uh, release from the uh, Department of Corrections, the corrections budget, and the um, obviously the inmates and other people involved in the system. Um, we all know why I think good time is something that has been used around the country. It's, it, there are multiple, multiple reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, just, just briefly, of course, it's in part a way of modifying behavior with a positive reinforcement that if you do what you're supposed to do when you're in a facility, you're going to get out sooner. Um, it is also a fiscal tool to aid the state in reducing the cost of the prison population. Um, and it also, in the long term, seems to have good rehabilitative results um, for the individuals who are uh, going through the system. Um, I, I've not seen a study that says that uh, good time has a negative impact on uh, rehabilitation. The interesting thing that th this bill does is selects out a few crimes that all end up with, uh, you know, life in prison at the end of their, at the end of the sentence except for one. Um, and uh, makes them a disqualifying crime for purposes of good time, absent a petition to the court. And then the court has to make a finding whether or not at that time it would serve the interest of justice for that individual's participation in good time uh, to uh, for, for that to occur and that it wouldn't unreasonably affect public safety. The thing that I find about that is that it's the wrong time <laughs> to make that determination. Um, the, uh, what you end up seeing a, one way or the other is it clearly a change in the way uh, people think and act and uh, approach their lives when once they have been incarcerated. Um, the determination at the beginning of the case, really at the beginning of their sentence case, um, of whether or not somebody um, is going to be an unreasonable risk to public safety um, is probably not the right time to do that. Because um, you don't know what a person is going to be 20 years down the road with some of these life in prison uh, sentences. I'm mindful of a individual who I represented in a murder case in the early 90s, and he was 18 years old at the time. 
um, and uh, went through that, uh, went through the court process and um, ultimately he was not, uh, not convicted. But if you saw that individual um, when he was 18 years old and what his life was like, uh, whether he was sentenced or not, uh, you would deem him an unreasonable risk to public safety. Um, he ended up joining the Marine Corps. He was in for a number of years. He got out. He started a business. Um, he now is uh, living on Long Island and is uh, um, owns a private investigation firm and is five times richer than I am. Um, the bottom line is that when a lot of these folks come into the system and we do are dealing with a lot of young people, um, it's very difficult to make the determination about the reasonability of somebody's effect on public safety at the time they're sentenced. Um, I'm concerned that, uh, and, I, and I also wanna talk about a little bit about some of these uh, individual uh, crimes that are listed as disqualifying offenses. But it seems to me when you, whenever you have a life sentence type case, effectively a judge is making a good time determination at the beginning of the sentence by virtue of the so length of the minimum sentence. Um, the judge is accounting for the effect on public safety and the uh, um, just interests of whether an individual, uh, you know, how long basically they're supposed to spend in jail before they have an opportunity to get out. That's what minimum sentences are for. Um, what these, what good time is supposed to do is give somebody an incentive to reduce that amount. So if a judge in any of these life in prison cases feels that uh, that person needs to spend 30 years in jail and good time might reduce that to, to, uh, uh, to 25 or 20 years, depending upon what the, what the case may be, they're going to impose a 35 year sentence. And we have seen this time and time again um, when uh, over the years, at least when uh, uh, judges are making accommodations for, for good time and when release dates might be. Um, the, uh, uh, I have a question about, it. so to me, the factor of that the court is considering in whether or not somebody would take part in good time is something that they take uh, uh, into account when they are deciding what the minimum sentence is to begin with. Uh, I do have questions about why manslaughter in violation of 2304 uh, Title 13 is on this list. Um, that's a 15 year felony um, with a one year uh, mandatory minimum that could can be suspended. Um, you know, burglaries have higher uh, sentences than, than manslaughter. And I understand somebody lost their life as part of uh, this, but it's a negligent, it's a negligent death, which to me stands out uh, starkly in this other, in the, in the rest of the list. It doesn't have a uh, um, life sentence attached to it. Um, and it's relative to the you know, spectrum of crimes that's out there to include on a list like this. It is one that uh, um, stands out as not consistent with any of the thinking that went into the other ones. Um, and so I would suggest that you probably should take that one. If you're, if you're gonna go forward this, if this is gonna pass, um, I would take manslaughter off the list. Um, I also have concerns about um, lascivious conduct with a child. Vermont has, in my, con in my estimation, in my 
looking at this over a long period of years, uh, an area of law um, in its sexual assault statutes that is uh, not fair and not consistent with reality. Um, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about where you have minors engaged in activity that gives rise to criminal liability under the lewd and lascivious conduct statute uh, with a child where you might have a, a 16 year old um, having relations uh, of some variety with a, with a 14 year old um, or a 17 year old with a 14 year old as, as you know, we have that provision where there's basically a three year yeah. window. Uh, but the negotiation, I was there when it occurred, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, um, the, you know, there was an, as it often is in the legislature, yeah. a negotiated uh, age limit. Um, Between the House and the Senate. Right. And, we, you know, the line was drawn at uh, the age of 15. Uh, but it, that doesn't take into account the reality of kids um, being involved with each other when they're 16 and 14, 16 and 13 and 15 and 13. And, and you know, basically kids who go to school together um, have the potential to get involved in particularly with um, lewd and lascivious conduct as opposed to uh, sexual assault on a minor. But the same issue goes for sexual assault on a minor. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and until we uh, until we address that, I would not want to disqualify um, kids who are, are engaged in in that kind of activity, which I think we can all agree occurs somewhat regularly um, from from good time. I mean, it's it's another one that sort of stands out to me as being inappropriate for this list. And, it, and it's one that in, in, of all of these, um, you know, we have a general thing where we tend to have a lot of youth in the system, but this is a one particularly where the, the uh, impact on youth would be um, inappropriate and disproportionate. Um, clearly the, uh, um, you know, what you're doing when you're, 16, 17, 18 years old is not what you're going to be doing if you end up spending, um, you know, two or three years in jail. You, you know, I, I, uh, to me, it it uh, it rings as an inappropriate uh, um, crime to put on the list. Similarly, with sexual assault, while that sexual assault includes a, a lot of different. Uh, activity, but I'm concerned about the uh, age gap regarding minors um, and how that impacts uh, individuals. One of the other things you're going to want to do with sexual assault cases, to be honest, and this is getting out of the whole youthful um, offender arena, and I don't mean that in the big youthful offender, I mean that in just young people engaged in uh, um, activity that's illegal uh, of a sexual nature. But you want to have people to be encouraged to uh, participate in programming, um, particularly if they're sex offenders. Um, treated sex offenders have a, relative to the total recidivism rate that we have, have a very low recidivism rate. Untreated sex offenders, um, it's, uh, it's quite the opposite. And to take away a, an incentive um, is, uh, I, I think, inappropriate. Now, I, I understand that the counter basically is that uh, a judge can override that by virtue of a hearing. And I get back to the issue of this is what judges do when they sit set minimum sentences. Um, I understand, obviously, with... Uh, uh, that it may be appropriate for cases like uh, first degree murder, um, aggravated sexual assault, aggravated murder and the like. Um, but this seems to dip kind of deep into the, uh, 
into the uh, kind of serious crime spectrum. Um, even even arson causing death um, is is for the most part a uh, unless it's intentional, um, usually a negligent act situation. The arson might be intentional, but the uh, cause of death may not be, and that's uh, um, you know again one of those things that it's it's very difficult to just stick it on a list and say we're carving these out. Um, I would also note from a logistical standpoint, nobody likes to hear this part. Um, this is going to, depending upon how it is dealt with by the Department of Corrections, if it were passed, going to end up in a bunch of litigation involving who gets what and how and when. Um, because the the uh, statute went into effect on January 1st. We're 15 days into um, good time for everybody. Um, or I, I guess the, we probably, it was probably excluded uh, aggravated murder, I think. Something was excluded the first uh, time. I think, yeah, I think we excluded those with a life sentence. Without yeah, anything with life without parole as a- uh, Was excluded. And, but, uh, you know, there's going to there's going to be a class of people who are previously sentenced who are entitled to good time post January one. There's going to be a, a class of people who are going to be sentenced post January one, um, and all of those have they have vested rights as of the first of January, um, and then there's going to be this other group that comes if this gets passed that will have other types of rights and i'm not even sure how those will will work particularly um the you know the question is there are going to be issues of retroactivity and ex post facto application yep. um and we're going to have to deal with all of that um you know the last time we sort of trued up the system um, basically, everybody who might be entitled to good time just got their good time, um, and it was an easy way to deal with it. Um, but at that point, good time was going away completely. Uh, this time, there we, we will have created three different classes of uh, good time participants, um, and so I unfortunately see work that really the prisoners' rights office, which they'll be doing. But and our appellate division is going to um, something we'd rather not be doing, to be honest. We'd rather not be uh, kind of litigating that nuance, but it is what we do. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And, uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't see that what is in place currently is an egregious violation of anybody's. Uh, uh, rights. I don't think that uh, the victims groups were excluded from participation in the process that went into this. Um, and I was in the house as the testimony came in from all sides. Um, and uh, uh, this was not a major issue um, until the rule was promulgated by the department and some victims who didn't feel that they had a voice in the process, uh, made their voice known. Um, I had an individual from the prisoner's rights office present at the public hearing um, or one of the public hearings. And uh, she was, it was her and there were 20 victims folks who had showed up um, and acted like it was the first time they'd heard of it. and. I understand that it's easy to miss things if the, if you're not, you know, knee deep in it uh, uh, from the beginning. Um, but this was not done under the radar, and um, I think trying to unravel it um, to identify um, a small group of crimes that uh, I think are already addressed through the sentencing process. Where, by the way. Um, the victims and victims advocates have the right at sentencing to comment on the appropriateness of the minimum and maximum of the sentence 
and whether it's suspended or not and uh, and the like um, that's where the appropriate impact it, or pro appropriate input is um, how how somebody reacts to their incarceration and what position they are in um, you know in participating um, in their programming in not causing problems and serving their time um, that is not something that is known um, at the time of sentencing and it is appropriately left to an administrative good time system like is done in almost every other state in the nation. I appreciate the testimony, Matt. Um, and uh, I don't know if there are other questions from Matt um, from anybody on the committee. Are there any questions? I, yes, Senator Baruth. This is not a question, but I just wanted to say that I think Matt makes a very good point about the hearing uh, and the and the petition. If that's occurring at the same time as the as the sentencing, if I'm a judge, it doesn't seem like I have very much to go on. I have what seems to be the legislature's intent that good time not be given to this person, and then I have victims there saying, "Don't give it to this person." I, I don't know how successful those hearings would be at that point. So if, if the bill does go forward, maybe that's something we should think about is selecting a time later on down the road to have those hearings. Well, there are, you know, I don't know. Um, Senator White, do you have a question or comment? No, I was just gonna say that I agree with uh, Senator Baruth. I think that it, it doesn't make much sense to do it at the time of sentencing. Well, I think that, you know, as I recall, all this discussion about good time being um, retroactive was the major discussion at the time that we were doing the bill. Um, so, and uh, are there any other, Senator White, and I've got a quiet, Marley is uh, so out of control. I, I guess I misunderstood what you said there, Senator Sears, and I'm sorry that, that just because it happens later on doesn't mean it's necessarily retroactive. I, I, I mean, right. I, I'm not sure that um, they're, they're connected in any way. It could, the hearing could be, unless I completely misunderstand this, the hearing could be later <clears throat> but still not be retroactive, but could be going forward. And there, or, or it Dick, could- you're, you're muted, Dick. Senator White, I was paying attention to Marley. I was talking about the process we used to draft the bill the last time. When we dealt with the bill, we, we heard, um, I believe uh, Sarah's correct, she wasn't there, but the I believe that we heard from uh, Chris Fenno and others that we did not hear objection. That's what I was talking about. I, I, I understand, um, I'm, hear, I'm hearing several concerns about the way the draft is, is currently in front of us. And that's not what I was, wasn't talking about that. And uh, to be clear, I'm not asking that there be a hearing down the road to me, the application of good time, whether somebody gets it or not, um, is the application, is the application. Uh, that's the decision that department is making as to whether or not an individual is uh, doing the right thing. To, what, is, what is really obvious here is that, that uh, um, some folks think that there's not enough punishment relative to these crimes and that as a result they should be excluded uh, from good time um, but to accommodate folks there's this out with this hearing at the beginning i don't think that it should be it's it's not the appropriate time in my view for that type of hearing and the good time system itself is the process to determine whether or not somebody is amenable to treatment and and the like and is um, would not unreasonably affect public safety down the road 
as is referrals to um, for uh, uh, parole um, or for uh, furlough. Well, assuming for a minute we pass this law with some changes um, and we only did it for those folks who have were sentenced prior to the passage of this law. Um, with that, and so in the future, I mean, the judge would know, everybody would know what the person was eligible for in good time and be part of the sentencing process. Um, oh, so, so you're the so you're the issue is here for these types of crimes or some group of them. The concern is the folks who prior to January 1st had already been sentenced. Yep. Well, I will, I will say that that uh, clears up some of the, some of the, uh, some of the concerns for sure. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that uh, individual inmates are not going to want to litigate it. And that would mean we'd have to pursue that for them. Understood. Um, but um, <clears throat> it clearly does sort of give the folks who are involved in whatever the prior plea agreement was, um, what they expected. Okay. Yep, Senator White. Um, I'm, I'm uh, showing my ignorance here, but <clears throat> just because you're eligible for good time, and you may even doesn't isn't there some kind of a system set up in DOC that then decides whether you're actually going to get it or not? Just like of course you said parole. Uh, I mean, yeah. you're eligible. A, I think the commissioner is is scheduled yeah. shortly after. Um, so I just I guess if that's the case, why would we um, prohibit anybody from being eligible? I think that the issue that I've heard loud and clear from several victims of some horrific crimes, some of the most horrific crimes that are being committed in the state, is that this is going against what they had understood the sentence to be for that individual by providing them with extra benefit. So you're essentially, let's just for the, um, just for the sake of argument, let's say you're taking five years off of a sentence of someone who committed a horrific crime and the victims had agreed to that sentence and now you're taking off five years. That's where the, what I've heard as the complaint. What I was suggesting was that down the road after this bill is effective, there, will, there would be the knowledge that the person was eligible for good time during the sentencing process. And the judge, if the judge wanted to or the state could argue for a longer sentence and they might otherwise because they would know everybody would know what the rules of the game are what we did was change the rules of the game midstream for those that had already been sentenced not, I, think, not that. I think one important thing to note though is that just because you are eligible for release doesn't mean that I, I they're yeah. going to release yeah. you or that they have to release you um when uh you know, as a result of the good time. I'm trying to make this, Matt, I'm trying to suggest that there are two separate categories here. One are people who have already been sentenced under a, a system that did not include good time. Right. And those who were sentenced in a system that did provide good time. I understand. C could I just add one more concern here that, and hopefully I'm not really misunderstanding this, but when somebody is sentenced and <clears throat> the victim is part of that um, hearing, that sentencing hearing, <clears throat> and then um, th say they're sentenced to 15 years, but they're eligible for parole uh -oh. at a certain time, don't, don't, isn't that, couldn't that also be seen as a violation of the, um, if they're given parole, couldn't that also be seen as a violation of the, um, Kind of agreement that was made with the victim and and when when there is a parole hearing i believe that victims 
appear. And if they're, and so I, I think that it, it's kind of the same system, but I may be wrong. Um, I wanted to, Matt, if you want to respond to that, I guess it was to you. It's, it's just another way for us to get people back out into society and, and we use very similar criteria. Uh -huh you know, with, with a board and, and uh, you know, I'm sure that victims are not always happy with the decisions the parole boards make um, and DC, the DOC isn't at times either, but uh, um, it's just one of the other tools that we have to get people out right. of facilities. Well, I went, before I turn to Jim Baker who has to leave, I just want to mention that that's part of what justice reinvestment was, is limiting the number of furlough options because the furlough was without victim as I understand it. So people would be out in the community without that input. The parole provides that input. Jim, if, I know you have to leave right away and we'll uh, jump to you for any comments and then go to Black O'Shea. Yes, Senator, listen, I, I did email- Interim Peggy Commissioner, in, interim commissioner. In, interim commissioner, Senator, thank you for that. Uh, for <clears throat> clarify the record. Uh, Senator, I did just email Peggy to let her know that I was going to stay on. I canceled my other commitment. Oh, oh. So if, if you've got other orders that you wanted to follow, uh, I can wait or I can go now. It's your, your call, sir. No, why don't you go ahead right now, Jim? Uh, then right, we'll thanks. go to Flacco and John Campbell. And right. uh, for the record, I am interim commissioner, Jim Baker, commissioner of corrections. Um, look, I, I, I want to say uh, clearly that corrections uh, our position is, is that we have supported justice reinvestment to um, we support good time. You know, the one thing that I get concerned about as I listen to this conversation and other conversations is that somehow this always ends up being corrections is good time program. And it, it is, uh, it's an unfair burden to put on corrections. I mean, this is the justice system good time program. And some of the feedback we got from victims um, when we put the rule out was uh, all over the charts. And you know, this work, this work came out of justice reinvestment too. And you know, we all supported it. And then, you know, there was a realization about the victims that we've talked about before in, in corrections. And as I continue to hear the dialogue about the the rule notification. Um, in, in the use of vans to do that. You know, we took criticism for that and I, and I understand it, but we have 15,000 victims in vans. And ironically, some of the victims who were victims of record didn't want to be notified about the rule change. And we actually had a situation with one of the individuals who became very hostile towards staff. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that whatever we decide to do, the more complicated this becomes, the more difficult it is for us to implement it, following the directions of the legislature and creating more than one system for us to manage victims creates a situation with four staff members who deal with 15,000 victims. Um, the more complicated we make it, the more chance that we're gonna make errors in that process. So uh, my position as the commissioner is, is that, you know, I, I understand what happened here, and I understand that people are weighing in uh, back and forth um, about victims and how we ended up in this conversation now looking to try to modify the work that came out of uh, reinvestment too. Um, but all I'm urging is whatever we decide to do, make it as clear as we possibly can, because uh, you know the Defender General and I agree on quite a bit. One of the things I'll agree on him today with is that um, I don't need more litigation in, in corrections. Um, we get litigated to death in corrections. Um, you know, as I, as I've said, I've been the commissioner for a little over a year. I think I'm named now in 120 lawsuits. Uh, so we, we get, we get litigated to death. So we, we as an organization have a high level of empathy for victims. We want to work with victims but we don't want to be seen as the only person in the system um, holding the bad news when it comes to victims. So I'm, I'm, I'm urging that, that whatever we do, 
upfront victims understand at the day of sentencing exactly what good time means. That should not be corrections as obligation to explain to victims um, at that point in time. That should be the judge, the prosecutor, defense attorney, people understand exactly what it is and then we manage that system. So uh, as far as the process is inside, I do have Dal Crook and Monica Weaver with me today. Um, they know this system much better than I do. I'm just trying to um, make sure we're clear where correction stands on this. And uh, we'll do whatever we're directed to do by the legislature. But remember, the more complication it goes into it, the more difficult it is for us to manage it. So that's that's my message, Senator. Thank you. That, that was part of the problem when we, why we discontinued good time because it was so complex. And, and look, so, you're always, Senator, you're always gonna have the situation where, and I agree with, with the Defender General on this, um, you're not always going to make people happy, but I heard, you know, you know, the, the one call that I took that I, mm -hmm. you know, we both got emailed on. Um, th those victims matter. And I, I know you're trying to all work through this system, but I just don't want to be in the position where it becomes complicated. And we're the ones that is seen as this is corrections is good, good time program. Right. That's, that's the message I wanted to deliver. Well, I'm clear. Thank you, Commissioner. Questions for Commissioner Baker? Interim Commissioner Baker. Senator Baruth. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for what you just said. I'm just wondering if we could go back to the basic management tool idea. Um, that's what I find myself coming back to. I remember when we were working on this and the idea was that um, this was helpful. <clears throat> inside the institution, it was um, perceived as, as a, a positive tool regardless of who it was being used with. Is that still your sense? It, it is, Senator. And I think, you know, again, I haven't read the studies, but I think uh, my staff tells me that most of the work that's out there academically on good time indicates that it is a good tool. And I do think it's a good incentive for folks. You know, the, the the vast majority of the people that we have incarcerated follow the rules, um, do what they're supposed to do to work on their issues. Um, but we have folks in the system that don't do that. So I think good time also offers the opportunity for incentive, especially when caseworkers are working with them to move them towards transition back to the community. I think it does give us a tool to do that. With that said, I fully understand what I heard from victims about what that means when they agree to a plea agreement and then all of a sudden find out there's a significant amount of time shaved off that sentence, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. All right, um, why don't we jump to uh, Flacco Schilling from the American Civil Liberties Union. Good morning. I guess you've been very busy lately. <laughs> There's been quite a lot going on, as with yeah. many other folks on this call. So yeah. um, I know we're all doing a lot of a lot of good and hard work. So thank you uh, for allowing me to testify this morning. My name is Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont, and I want to come and speak before you today to act to oppose S one S eighteen uh, for many of the reasons that folks have already heard so far. Um, I'm going to echo many of the things that the commissioner actually just said. So we also are big supporters of Justice Reinvestment 2. This was one of the top recommendations from the Justice Reinvestment 2 working group. I think it's recommendation 1C. And when we heard from the, the folks from the Justice Center, the implementation of good time was one of the most effective tools we had at reducing our prison population. So this is something that um, when you look at those recommendations and the recommendations that have come out in reports both from 2019 and 2018 um, show that Good Time is a positive program, pro positive management tool for within inside facilities. And we also believe that we should be incentivizing good behavior for everyone who is incarcerated by the Department of Corrections. And that also applies to people who have committed some of the most serious crimes that we want to have those incentives for good behavior. And we also want to have those program management tools available. So one of the discussions that has come up in both this testimony and the testimony previously is the idea of whether or not this credit should be applied to people 
who were previously incarcerated before this change went into effect. And this is something that's been talked about at, at length, both through the committee's process last year. And also there's a full report that was put together prior to last session. And this was a, a report put together by the, by DOC, the Center for Crime Victim Services, the Judiciary, Sheriffs and States Attorneys, the Attorney General and Defender General. And the consensus recommendation from that report is that good time should be applied to everyone who is currently incarcerated and moving forward. They give a number of reasons for this in this report. If you look at, um, so the report was delivered on uh, December 15th of 2019. The recommendations uh, revolve around program impact, and I'm going to read quickly from the, that report, if you, if it, you may, if I may. So it yeah, says before you, um, if it's possible for Peggy, for Peggy to get a copy of that report and post it on the committee webpage, that would be helpful. Yep, yeah, happy to send that over. And this was a report that was discussed, I know, a great deal in House Correction. Yeah, I, I got the copy of the report, but yeah. it's sitting in my Montpelier file cabinet. Yes, and it's, I'm sure, buried somewhere on the legislative website and happy to help resurface yeah. that. Um, but what the report in basically says, increased participation will have a greater impact on morale and behavior. If many people are left ineligible for the program, the effect on the facility environment is diminished. It will also create dis disparity and confusion, confusion among the incarcerated population. So one of the main uh, reasons to have this apply to everyone is the impact within the facilities. And the others that is noted in this report is the administrative impact, uh, which and in the report says, including previously sentenced inmates, eliminates the potential for mistake, delay in processing paperwork, and allows for clear communication as to who is eligible to receive good time and awards. The DOC Sentence Computation Unit is responsible for its activity. Any additional burden on requirements to track the various populations would lead to uncertainty and complexity. And this is really important because as we were having this conversation last year around good time, one of the things that was, was raised over and over again was that increased complexity in the system that, uh, that existed before was one of the things that brought that system down. That level of complexity made it difficult to administer, generated lawsuits. It was one of the reasons that it was, was revoked, uh, I guess, in the early 2000s. So that's something that we want to raise, um, this discussion of who should be uh, included Everyone who is currently incarcerated should be included in this program, and we oppose carve outs to that program. Also, just want to note that um, there's broad public support for reducing sentence lengths in a, in a um, poll we did last year with Lake Research. 70% of Vermonters supported reducing sentence lengths um, for people who are incarcerated here in Vermont. Um, and also, I'd just like to bring up the fact that um, making this change at this time. Is, is definitely gonna be putting more of a burden on the Department of Corrections. Within the last year, we have asked them to do not just an emergency rulemaking, but a full rulemaking on this, this program. And this would be asking them to do a third rulemaking possibly within the span of one year. And it's not like there's been new facts brought to light about this program and how it might impact people. These were discussions that were envisioned um, through the process last year. So in short, uh, we just we, I'm happy to have the opportunity to come forward today and say um, we oppose this legislation. We'd like to see the law stay as, as it currently is. And this is one time when we're basically asking you to do nothing. So uh, that is my testimony for today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, questions, I think, pretty clear from me, my perspective. Um, any thoughts on the discussion about those that are currently sentenced to were in some of the most heinous crimes in the state, and they made plea bargains to avoid life without parole since. Um, and that, that really is one of the groups we're talking about. Um, there are, and I'm curious if there's any comment on a small, that small group. So um, we think this program should be applied uniformly throughout the system. Um, almost 99% of all uh, criminal cases within the state of Vermont are resolved through plea deals. So that's not unique to people who have committed these crimes. And we have to understand that this is being applied to everyone who's uh, had a plea deal and there are victims of many of those crimes as well. But also we wanna look at our criminal justice system and say, we need to be providing these incentives, especially for the people who've committed some of the most serious and heinous crimes because almost all of them are going to be re-entering their communities and it's in the best interest of all of us 
to provide those supports and those incentives, as well as the program management tools and the facilities to help make them safer for the people who live and work there. Senator White. Thank you. Uh, so Falco, thank you. Um, my question, I guess, is that just because someone is eligible for earned time, just as they're eligible for parole, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be awarded it. I mean, they may be in, when it, am I right about that or am I wrong? You are correct about that, that just because someone is eligible for good time does not mean that they'll necessarily earn that time or that they'll be released um, any earlier once they've reached their minimum sentence based on uh, a number of other factors. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure Monica, I saw Monica chime in or come up on the screen. I'm sure she could correct me if I said anything incorrect. <laughs> Monica, did you want to comment? Uh, good morning, everyone. It's Monica Weber. I'm the Administrative Services Director at the Department of Corrections. And I did, I, I know, Senator White, you've asked that question a few times. And Falco, yes, you were um, very accurate. Um, the awarding of good time, again, relies on <clears throat> the offender's behavior if they're not adjudicated of a major uh, disciplinary action. Uh, they will receive the good time. Um, so there, there is that trigger. And as you've all mentioned, once someone reaches their minimum release date, it is not an automatic release. There are lots and lots of factors um, that come into play there. Certainly, if you have more questions about that, um, Dale can answer um, all of them. He's um, sort of the expert in that area. So we, we just wanted to let you know that we, we're here to, um, to give you that information if you need yeah, it. I, I think I am going to hopefully call on Dale at some point in the near okay. future to um, maybe this morning or later. But th the basic question is us better understanding the process and how during good time would affect the person. And, I, and I'm going to just try to frame the question I think the committee is asking is, how does earn good time impact the actual date of release off of the minimum? Um, so, first yeah, I, I mean, certain, that, that's what I think that we need to better understand why that person wouldn't be necessarily released just because they took, um, you know, whatever a year's worth of good time accumulated would mean off the sentence. Looking at that for an example, does that it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get out. And I I really need to understand how good time impacts the furlough system moving forward. Because we had a confusing system of letting people out on furlough without any victim input, as I understand. It. And then they're out on furlough, but they're not on parole, they're still sentenced. So it's a different category part of what we tried to replace with, if I'm not mistaken, with good time was to eliminate many of the furlough statuses. Um, yes, so, there were. So that, that has to be taken into consideration. I know in one particular case that we're all familiar with where the, the guy escaped on furlough, um, the, were vic the families of the victim who was murdered in the Bennington area um, contacted me outraged that he could continually get out on furlough. There was no parole process. So I, those are the questions that I have when we get back to you. Uh, oh, do you want sorry, to I was just gonna say quickly, one other thing that I'd like to note is no, I, in all the changes that were made in Justice Reinvestment too, there was the institution of a presumptive parole program, but anyone who uh, was convicted of the crimes considered in this bill would not be eligible for presumptive parole. So it's one of, that is not anything that's interacting with what we're talking about here. Um, they would go through the normal process. None of those changes would actually apply to these people. Senator Benning, and I jumped ahead of us. And I apologize to Neil and Monica. For doing that. Uh, no, but you no. did you did bring up a, a reason for me to ask this question now. One of the desires of this legislation is to empower corrections with a management tool. And it makes perfect sense to me, which is why I'm supporting the bill, but I'm curious to know from all of you and Commissioner Baker especially, why shouldn't the same process be available for someone on probation? 
it seems to me there is a logical connection that uh, probationees and probationers could have another management tool um, that might decrease the length of time that they are on probation and clogging up filing cabinets. Can I just ask that we hold off on the probation issue until next week when I'm trying to schedule the Justice Center to come in and talk about the Minnesota model and why credit for probation may not be the best thing to, to do to accomplish the same goal. Um, I, there is a full report that I'm trying to schedule for next Thursday. And Bryn is in the midst of drafting that. And, uh, Commissioner Baker and others are very familiar with what went on and Justice Reinvestment Two working group on this issue. So I, I would ask if we could hold off until next week, Joe. I'll withdraw the question. Thank you. Um, Blacko, any other comments or questions? No, I think that's all I have for today, but I'll, I will sub, I'll send along that study um, along with the polling results. That, that would be fantastic. much appreciated. Um, we're, we're asking for um, to get sent our files that were there from last year, since we're right now dealing with three bills that are connected to last year, expungement, uh, competencies, and trial in this good time. So, well, thank you so much. Senator White. So this may not be the time to ask this, but um, I was confused by what Joe said about because he sees it as a good management tool in the in the facilities that he supports this bill. So is this the time to ask him that or should we do that later? I think during committee discussion would be a better time oh, to thanks. figure out why we're doing what we're doing. Um, uh, the next witness is James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys. We'd originally had John Campbell, but uh, he likes to leave the tough stuff to Pepper. Well, thank you uh, for having us here, uh, or for me having me here. Uh, yeah, this is my first time in the committee this, this year, and it's great to see all of you back and can pick up kind of right where we left off in September. Um, yep. So uh, for the record, James Pepper from the Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, our department has served on several good time study committees over the last two to three years. Um, the states of the state's attorneys, uh, many of whom have lived through the prior iteration of earned good time, had certain criteria that they wanted to see accomplished in any earned good time program moving forward. Um, the first was that they wanted Earn Good Time to be an evidence-based program that can promote rehabilitation, reduce harm, and reduce recidivism. And then the second criteria was that it has to be easily administered with clear criteria for earning the time so that victims and prosecutors understand all of the potential accrual at the time of sentence. Uh, this, of course, is important for uh, truth in sentencing so that victims can establish that sense of finality um, that's so critical to their healing process. And prosecutors uh, just need to know what the potential impact would be so um, there's sufficient time for programming and supervision. Um, what ultimately passed in Act 148 uh, satisfied this criteria to our satisfaction. Um, you know, we heard uh, plenty of testimony from the council from state governments who was looking at uh, the impact of earned good time on other states to uh, satisfy the kind of evidence-based harm reduction, um, promote uh, rehabilitation aspects. Uh, certainly, um, this program is easily administered or at least has clear criteria. I mean, at times almost it seems like it's too easily administer the criteria is too clear. Um, you know, there was an earlier bill with earned good time that uh, required um, offenders to, to kind of work through a merit-based programming system to earn good time. And that was removed. And I understand the reasons for removing it. Um, but this certainly does make 
the kind of calculation of earning period time at the time of sentencing very easy to understand. Um, so then the question, of course, uh, has turned to whether earned good time should apply to the currently sentenced population or just move prospectively to people that will be sentenced after the implementation of the rule. And then also secondarily, whether to exempt certain categories of crimes from earning good time. Uh, Falco mentioned a, a report um, that came out uh, that uh, our department and Center for Crime Victim Services participated on. We, we grappled with that issue. Um, we heard strong arguments both for and against applying it. I think some of the rationale for um, accepting uh, the kind of, it's not retroactive, but applying it to the currently sentenced population. Um, uh, the, some of the arguments in support of it. Um, ultimately though, um, we believe that because it implicates finality that really the victim's voices and the victim's advocacy groups um, should, uh, uh, we were gonna defer to them and we continue to defer to them today. Uh, so, um, you know, for us, the program makes sense, but if there are victims concerns in the center and the network and other advocacy groups support S-118, then we will support it as well. Um, I would just uh, mention a few things um, that have come up today. Um, one is around the name um, of earn good time. You know, so much of how people react to hearing about good time um, is dependent upon you know how they think about sentencing and the purposes of sentencing and rehabilitation and being able and really victims need to have their voices heard and. I think at least some of the sting around the announcement of earned good time in the victim communities could have been avoided if we had the time to make those personal notifications to victims um, or hold public forums um, and really discuss the benefits of earned good time um, and what it can offer. Uh, of course, you know, the bill wasn't passed until September of last year and the program was required to be implemented on January 1st. And so I just don't think that we had the time to do those, that kind of work that, that could have been done. Um, I, think, I think that's an important point that this bill was done during um, remote work. It's an example of some of the issues that you want when we're trying to do it. Absolutely. If, if the bill had passed, you know, if we had a few more months, if it passed in the normal course of business, um, you know, in, in June, we had a few more months. I think a lot of, you know, and we had a chance to reach out to victims individually, especially with the most serious crimes. Um, I think, you know, the rollout could have been uh, less painful uh, for, for, for the victims of crime. Um, but again, with respect to the name specifically, you know, it, it, it feels, it feels, it, it just, it, you know, I think something like earned credit accrual or something along the lines that kind of really um, doesn't suggest to folks that, that, you know, people are, I mean, I, I recognize some of the arguments we've been hearing around the um, With respect to the question about is sentencing the right time for people to file petitions in order to accrue earned good time to become eligible? Um, I mean, essentially, this is the time where, you know, we have the most direct conversations with state attorneys and the victim's advocates with around this question of finality. Um, and so um, whether it's the right time or not, it's the, it's the best time for victims to know all of the potential impacts of the Earn Good Time program. And, you know, when we're talking, we're talking about um, the petition only for kind of a subset of the quote unquote big 12 crimes or, or like some of the more serious offenses. And, um, you know, judges will have some sense at the, at the time of sentencing. These issues often take, you know, year, years to litigate. Um, they're almost all eligible for hold without bail. Not all of them, but most of them are. So, you know, if these people are being detained pre-trial or if they've you know, been awaiting trial for a year or two years, you know, there is some information that a judge will have at the time of sentencing to see how they've been re reacting and responding to 
supervision and program. So I don't have much more than that, um, but if uh, there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I have uh, uh, two questions. One, one is, um, <clears throat> maybe Eric can answer this, but my recollection of our September meetings was we were looking also at what did other states do. And I believe there's a number of states that have provisions that um, single out certain crimes that are not eligible for earning good time. Um, and maybe Eric has that or you have that in. I don't remember. I believe that's right. And there are a number of incentive-based programs around the country when the corrections department Did, corrections administers. Do we have a document on that, Eric? No, I, I can check with, Bryn covered that issue in the fall with justice reinvestment. Okay, I, I think somebody might have a document that shows what other states do. Uh, when you get down to specific crimes that are not part of the earn good time. And I, so I, which was my way of asking about uh, Matt's testimony regarding if we're going to do this, should um, C3, manslaughter and violation of 13 BSA 2304, and C5, lewd and lascivious conduct with a child in violation of 13 BSA 2602, should they be included? Um, if that's a question for me, I mean, I would hate Yeah, it is. Yeah. Those are, of course, incredibly serious crimes, manslaughter. You know, there is a person who is dead. Um, there, there's a, there's a, so, I mean, I wouldn't want to get into negotiating here in this forum over which crime should or shouldn't be included. But I can tell you that those crimes that you have included are some of the most impactful for victims um, and victims' families. So I think that was probably the motivation for including them in um, I'm, you know, I would, again, you know, hope that you, you hear from some of the victims. And I know you've done a good job of hearing from the victims. Advocates. Well, we're going to try to get some victims in the next week and a half or so to testify. We've got a couple who have volunteered to testify. And I'm sure we'll hear from some others. Um, other questions for the state's attorneys and James Pepper? Pepper, thank you very much for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, the next witness is Dale Crook. Crook. And Dale, um, thank you for being here. And um, We're excited to hear from your position and what how this will complicate your life. Uh, well, I mean, I think it was mentioned uh, Previous testimony. Uh, for the record, my name is Dale Crook. I'm uh, the director of field services for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, you know, th this is a really difficult uh, decision point that, that um, folks are trying to kind of weigh through. Good time works. Um, there's there's tons of evidence that good time works, um, uh, but there's also the the rights and the needs of the victims uh, to have their um, concerns heard. Uh, so, you know, I think the commissioner brought out, like I, our, our main concern is just make sure it's a straightforward system. Um, uh, the, the system that's proposed adds a few layers of complexity. Uh, one for one, we're looking at, at certain charges um, and then um, post 2000 and uh, now it would have to be looking at a, um, a letter or um, the judge's decision to earn or not earn good time. So it just adds layers. Uh, we're not arguing one way or the other, uh, but the, the more layers and complexity adds, it does open us up for, um, for concerns and issues and grievances um, and, and litigation. Um, there, are, you know, there are multiple options that have been kind of brought around here, but we do understand the concerns of the victims and, and having um, pre-2000, and 11, 2021, 1121, excuse me, um, individuals earning, I can see the concerns from the victims. Um, you know, the, the, when you start having carve outs and determining if things uh, do or do not get good time, if we do it pre that date or post that date when the bill becomes effective, 
um, you, you will have impacts on on the projected savings from JRI. That, that that's it's just a fact on that. Um, not arguing one way or the other. It just it will cut into the savings. Um, but good time is you know if you look at good time as part of the entire as a component of the entire package of JRI, um, it is an incentive based. Um, system and the department is working on incorporating incentives in, into how we supervise and how we maintain our facility population. Um, uh, uh, as far as furlough, I'm trying to remember some of your questions, uh, Senator. Well, here. The, how would we change the furlough system with some of the understanding that people who may have committed some of these listed eight, nine crimes were eligible for furlough, which did not involve the victims, did not involve a parole process um, and had been getting furlough. So now we've eliminated that opportunity. Will that further complicate any type of release for those individuals? No, for, for offenders coming up to their minimum sentence, they're eligible for furlough and parole. Um, if someone is registered in our victim notification system and they're coming up on release, they will get a notification if they're registered in the system. So all victims that are registered do, do get notified. So the, the problem is sometimes the victim isn't registered in the VIN system. Correct. Sometimes that's an issue. And that, and that sometimes gets on the front end of the system uh, where we try to have good coordination and collaboration with the state's attorney's victim advocate so to make sure that all the information is presented um it's a it's a it's just information sharing um and and i think the more that we can work on that understanding the better um as so far so as oh, sorry sir so somebody who was convicted of murder in violation of 13 bsa 2301 the victims would have a voice in any parole hearing should a parole hearing occur correct because they received good time, the parole hearing might come up sooner. There still would, there's not a guarantee that they would be paroled. Is that correct? So, so an individual at their minimum will be eligible for furlough or parole. So um, they'll have their statutory requirement for the parole review. Um, victims will be heard um, if, if they're called upon. And, and that's a parole process that can occur and the victim will be heard. For, for the department to release someone on furlough, they have to meet certain, it's the presumption that they will be released unless there's reasons for the department not to release an individual. Someone not completing uh, their required risk reduction programming, someone that poses a risk to an individual or the community. Um, institutional behavior that um, uh, brings concern that there could be a public safety if the individual released. So we have certain, um, criteria that we follow in order to be called a delay of the release. So we delay a release of someone at their minimum. Um, if, if someone comes in and they don't pose a risk and they complete all their risk reduction needs and programming and they do everything they're supposed to do um, and they have a residence and an approved release plan, they will be released at their minimum. Um, and we will notify the victims of the release. Um, that's the, the system is kind of geared for that. Um, the, the presumption mm -hmm. is that an offender will be released. The presumption is that the offender will be released at their minimum unless there's a reason for the department not to release them. Um, and sometimes those reasons that we have, um, the defender general may argue against and sometimes um, litigations can occur from that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it does help, it does help. Okay. Other questions for Dale, Monica, or Commissioner Baker who's still online? Monica has her little hand up. I don't know if that means anything. Oh, I can't see her hand. You usually Sorry. wave, Monica. Oh, okay. I'll it's I'll fine. wave. I'm so, I'm just trying to follow the rules, but I'll I'll wave. I I did want to add one one thing to what Dale um, brought up, and you know, in the example, Senator, that you gave, you used the crime of of murder. And we also do have a process where we identify very sensitive cases, um, where we do a much more sort of personalized outreach in those in those particular cases to the victims. Our victim services specialists, staff will, you know, work with people on uh, release plans and and safety plans. So that you know, there are some people who get a notification 
uh, through vans. Um, and then there are um, another subset of people who, who get a little uh, bit more uh, engagement with the victim service specialists. Thank you for bringing that up, Monica. We, as, as the commissioner said, we have 15,000 individuals registered in vans, um, but there is only direct victim services for, uh, we assign big, our victim services specialists only to the more serious cases and ones that are kind of presented in this bill and more of the listed ones that, that could have a major impact. Um, I got uh, that raises another question. And this is where I think we get confused sometimes and I'm confused about it. Individual is convicted of one of the crimes that's listed on this list and also a crime that's not on this list. Will they be receiving good time on the crime not on the list? I, I think you, I think the legislature should make that clear how they want certain things like that applied. If, if you're gonna have two different systems, for example, you have anyone before the, 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 the start date of, of the law will not earn good time and people post will, what happens if someone that is in one category crosses over and picks up a new offense? So, I, yeah, my specific question was somebody convicted of murder, but also convicted of um, burglary and occupied dwelling, which is not on this list, but may have been part of another crime, and they're convicted of both of them. What what do we do if we have two sets of rules? Well, we what we would probably do is we'd have to make a determination, work with with our legal staff, but. Um, I would indicate probably we would not award the individual um, good time if they have one of those disqualifying offenses. Should, that would should be, we be clear in the bill? That would be good. Um, that would be very helpful. The, the clearer you are about what you want the department to do and how we apply good time, the better it is for everyone. Um, um, so the more... Um, things not clearly defined, the department will try to interpret it in one way um, and others may interpret it a, another way. Um, so if it's clear in statute and language, um, it's easier for us to apply and, it, and, it's, and it's more easily defendable by the department. Thank you. I, I, I didn't mean to complicate things, but it's, it, more than one crime. Ooh, that's just that one. Uh, many times, it's a series of crimes. Okay. Other questions for Dale, Commissioner Baker, or Monica? Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a good time to take a short break, uh, maybe 15 minutes, and come back hearing from. Uh, Vincent Aluzzi and um, Judge Grierson and anyone else that I missed on the list. So if we can come back at quarter after 10, uh, our next witness is Vincent Aluzzi, I believe representing the VSEA and not the state. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, welcome back everyone. Um, one of uh, one of my successors here in Essex Orleans is uh, a new member of the Senate, and uh, I can't imagine how a freshman legislator, or uh, frankly any person just starting out as a lobbyist or as a um, uh, uh, even a, a, a staff person, uh, just any any interaction, it's so hard without developing the relationships and get a sort of the feel and flow of the building. So I'm pleased that the committee remains unchanged with you know with you folks, and I'm glad to uh, to be here. I, I, as far as good time, um, in t before I left the legislature. Uh, Corrections was overseen by by Senate institutions, and in 2000 we passed a good time bill, uh, supported in part by former Governor Dean, uh, because of the uh, 
inability of folks to know what would be the uh, effect of a, of a sentence. And uh, so that was kind of a, 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 a line in the sand in 2000. And, you know, it's been 20 years since then. And, and uh, you know, the rules have changed a, a number of times. At, at that time, there was a real shortage in corrections. So the department would loosely um, use the furlough process. And uh, there was a lot of pushback, public pushback, and, and that's why that yeah. statute was passed. Um, in preparation for today, our um, VSCA organizers reached out to um, members of our organization and uh, we represent among, among all the corrections uh, staff, we also have within the Department of Corrections uh, uh, victim service specialists who are uh, victim advocates, if you will, except they deal with once the case has been handed over to the uh, Department of Corrections and the, the most comprehensive response was really a response about the general uncertainty that the legislation created uh, when it was enacted. And uh, I, I know that the purpose of the bill is not to revisit the entire question, but rather to uh, fine tune it and, and, uh, and make, uh, modifications that you feel are necessary. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to uh, suggest that there are a lot of lists that have been created over the years. I think the first list uh, when I was there that was created was the listed crimes bill, which highlighted some of the offenses which uh, were considered either the most egregious or the most violent. And uh, in looking at this draft legislation, the it's a unique list and I may have missed, you know, a prior summer meeting in which, you know, one through uh, eight were put together. So uh, the, the, the input I would have to kind of give some finality to individuals who are interacting with the system uh, would be one to suggest that there be, uh, to the extent you can do so, um, uh, a reference to existing offenses which have been identified by the legislature um, as, as being particularly uh, e egregious or um, ones that, you know, stand out from the others, like the listed crimes uh, uh, legislation that was passed, I think, back in the late 90s or early uh, 2000s. And um, those are, those are, that's a thought. The other thought is, it's, it's like when you give a, a speech someplace and you want to recognize all the individuals who have either you know, participated in some activity which is being recognized or honored. And you always worry about leaving out the, the one person who uh, played a key role and, and deserves recognition. And as you, as you structure the bill, um, in addition to you know, considering some of the lists that the legislature has already um, included particular uh, crimes or offenses. Another thought would be to take a look at the uh, Title 13 and look at the chapters and subchapters which break down the <coughs> offenses. Um, for example, there are a number of offenses here which, um, you know, there's, there's a, certain categories of, of uh, homicide, there's one a particular offense for, for, for their sexual assault and aggravated sexual assault. But as you look at the uh, 
at the uh, there are a number of other offenses uh, which by omission uh, without being listed perhaps should be considered and for example if you look at um, sexual assault it's it's chapter you know 72 of, of title 13 and then there's you know human trafficking there are a number of offenses which the state through its criminal justice system has identified as a particularly egregious offenses against other persons. So that might be a thought uh, as far as how the bill is structured. Uh, because if you look through the, the chapters, there are certain categories. And then of course, in those categories, you may wish to make exceptions, but nonetheless, um, just a thought there. Over the um, last several years, the workload for our members who work at the Department of Corrections has increased uh, dramatically. And uh, you know from perhaps other committees that there are a number of vacancies. There's mandatory overtime. Uh, there is, you know, the, the COVID impact with, I think last week there were four facilities on lockdown. And I think one rule should be to uh, make the legislation automatic. Once you come to terms with which offenses apply uh, or and receive good time versus those who don't, it has to be, uh, you know, a statutory credit because the staff is overwhelmed uh, with uh, all of the duties and tasks that they have within the system. Uh, I know as a state's attorney that uh, these days, I would say in 95 to 98% of the cases that are resolved, the uh, goal is to ensure that the sentence if it's a two serve sentence uh, includes sufficient time for completing programs that are offered uh, in the facilities as opposed to out in the community. And uh, sentences often are structured after conferring with the DOC sentence uh, computation unit. And the goal always is to ensure that the sentence imposed is one which will enable uh, programming to be completed and give the department sufficient leeway to address uh, those who do not complete those sentences. And so um, it would be a good idea to the extent that already has not been done uh, to build in um, some provision that allows uh, programming contemplated by the sentences to be completed uh, before the uh, good time uh, legislation uh, would result in the release of a particular um, individual. Again, most sentences these days uh, even though they are uh, do include a, a punitive component, the punitive component often tracks the necessary time that it will take for a person to successfully complete programs offered inside the uh, facility. So overall, uh, that's those are the suggestions. Uh, that I have uh, at, in, in light of the draft. And we, 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 we did not have a chance to hear from a lot of folks, but the ones who did respond, uh, in particular, the victim services specialist who sent a relatively long email did bring up the concern that folks really need to know what the plan for in their lives when uh, someone is sentenced, particularly in crimes in which there are victims. So that's that's pretty much all I have today. Thank you. Other questions for 
Mr. Luzzi, Senator White. In terms of making it um, less complicated for forest staff and easing the burden on them, wouldn't it be less complicated and more straightforward if everybody was eligible and then the determination was made at the time of <clears throat> just like parole or furlough that they would be released unless there were circumstances? I mean, wouldn't, instead of having many different categories, wouldn't that make it easier on the staff? Well, um, there was suggestion about litigation. You know, the, the, the commissioner said that the, 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 the department is often involved in litigation. And unless it's an automatic statutory um, triggering of when the good time kicks in, it then requires some discretion on the part of the department. And we have a large DOC contingent that we represent. And one of the recurring themes is that it's simply a um, overwhelming task to comply with all the different uh, you know, dictates and mandates, not that they object to them philosophically, but from a logistical standpoint, it has to be um, it has to be by rote more or less. And to do otherwise, they feel is simply just going to set the department back uh, further and you know cause more turnover because uh, they will be viewed as not meeting, the expectations of the of the department, which is attempting to meet the expectations of the statute, so it's it's difficult at this level without looking at a you know a final version of the bill to offer any more thoughts. I'm kind of presenting themes to keep in mind as you craft subsequent uh, iterations of this uh, legislation. I guess, can I follow up on that? Yes, yeah, sure. I, I guess one of the <clears throat> things that we heard was that um, if ever, that we're trying to do more things individually as opposed to um, doing them just by rote and by uh, having one rule apply to everybody. And I, I just um, wondered about one of the things that Falco said was that uh, having different systems will create disparity among the prisoners. And if, if that's the case, will that not increase the, um, the complexity for the people who are working with the uh, population? Because you're going to have some people who are eligible, some people who aren't eligible, some people are getting, some people aren't getting. And I, I just, um, I just wondered about that. Well, the only thought I have there is is, is uh, perhaps re, re, refocusing on my comment that a lot of the sentences, you know, with the exception of uh, the more the more serious offenses, the listed crimes, if you will, you know, homicide and sexual assaults and kidnapping and the more serious lewd and lascivious cases. By and large, I'd say, you know, Senator Benning's in the, in the same business. I would say that by and large, sentences are structured with programming needs in mind. So the minimum is sufficiently long so that if the person is expected to complete a rehabilitative program while incarcerated, the minimum sentence is tailored to ensure that that sentence will be done. If you for example, make this retroactive, um, that may have an adverse impact on, on the goal that, you know, the, in, in most cases are resolved by plea agreement, that would have a, sort of an unintended consequence on sentences which were agreed to by all parties, including the court. And now you, you automatically apply good time. And so the person may be three quarters or uh, two thirds of the way through a a rehabilitative program and they're released as a matter of law. So that's a consideration as you look retroactively, if you look retroactively, make the law retroactive. So I, I, 
I, I, I guess I'd have to I, I'd have to give more thought about how to, to structure it, but those are just some concerns. I might have misunderstood, but I th thought when Monica was talking about it, she said that it wouldn't necessarily be automatic because when they come up for the for the release, it's going to depend on whether they've had serious infractions and whether they've completed their um, programming. I think that's what it's called, programming. So that it isn't just automatic that there will those other things will be taken into consideration. Well, uh, looking at the bill as I did, it, you know, it was not adjudicated of a major disciplinary violation, not reincarcerated uh, from the community, and uh, maybe it's embedded in the rule which I have not seen. But if if it's if it's addressed, then that's. I guess one less consideration, but just suggesting to the committee to, to take a look at that. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Aluzzi? Thanks Vince, very much. Um, we we'll now you. go to Judge Grierson. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, Judge. For the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, and um, thank the committee for inviting me to comment on this this bill. I I, I was struck as I was listening to uh, the testimony from the various witnesses this morning. Um, no matter what uh, perspective they came from, you you were, you were hearing some common terms: uh, inconsistency, disparity. Um, and as I look at this bill, and I want to make sure I understand it in its present form. Uh, beginning with uh, section 818, everyone was eligible for uh, good time. This bill then in paragraph five carves out certain offenses that are later listed in the bill as to be th that are the folks that are presently serving sentences of those offenses would be disqualified from any further good time. But then section six allows individuals who are charged and convicted of those same offenses may become eligible for good time, uh, depending on how the court views that. So that creates at least one layer of disparity between uh, individuals convicted of the same offense. I think the more, and I've been trying to get some input from uh, more judges uh, as I was preparing for this today. Um, the concern is, and you've all heard from the, as part of the justice reinvestment um, sessions, that about 98, 99% of the cases are resolved through plea agreements. And so you have to ask yourselves, as you look at section six, what is that going to do to plea agreements? Um, is and that will certainly vary from county to county, which I think adds another layer of inconsistency. In other words, someone may reach a plea agreement that is a conditional plea agreement, and I'm sure Senator Benning and, and others um, who are practicing in the courts have experience with those. Um, that, in other words, the, the state's attorney and defense attorney agree. Uh, to a certain sentence that they want the court to accept, but it's conditional, uh, perhaps from the state's attorney's perspective or the defense, on how the court rules on good time. So you actually go through a hearing on this one, perhaps on this one issue. Um, and the only criteria as I read section six is um, balance of in the interests of um, justice and public safety. And so in, in effect, I, I, it appears to me that the way it's presently structured is you are looking at creating more, the possibility of more inconsistency among sentencing for similar types of offenses. Now I will say that every case, no matter if it's the same type of offense, um, the sentence is individual um, and it's, it's wrong to compare one sentence to another of a similar offense because there could be any number of factors that influence the judge's ultimate decision. Um, but there's a big difference between a contested hearing 
a sentencing hearing and uh, a, a plea agreement or uncontested sentencing. But this would seem to then open the door for more contested sentencing over this issue and conditional sentencing. The, the um, paragraph six also talks about uh, if the defendant petitions for this. I cannot imagine any defendant, um, whether you narrow this list or expand this list, every defendant will file that petition. And uh, if, if not, that would probably create an issue down the road for ineffective assistance of counsel. So you can anticipate that for every offense on this list, the defendant will petition for a good time. Um, and, and depending on how the plea agreement is structured, um, it may come in as a conditional agreement, uh, but I can see between state's attorneys, between counties and between individual judges, um, you know, we, we hear repeatedly, um, particularly in this committee and House Judiciary about the inconsistency among counties and sentencing. The way this is structured, it seems to just lend uh, further argument to that. And, and ultimately, you're asking the court, the judiciary, to be the arbiter of whether or not an individual is eligible for good time. That eligibility uh, and how they qualify for it would seem to me to be more of an administrative um, de decision uh, a decision for the legislature. You're, you're leaving it then up to an individual judge on a given day under given circumstances to determine whether this person uh, is eligible for um, good time over a sentence that they may be facing of anywhere from 10, 20, whatever. We're talking most serious offenses. Um, so we're, we're talking about a, a decision that's made on that particular day that's going to impact that individual, obviously, for the whatever time they're in, in the facility. And then the question also comes into play is what if they, they agreed to the underlying sentence, but they, the court's ruling on good time, uh, are they entitled to appeal that at that, at that point in the process? So some, some other witnesses talked about litigation. Um, it, it, this could create that uh, additional litigation. I, I think, and I think, in, in an attempt to, I think, an attempt to create uh, perhaps more consistency. I think the bill, at least in its present form, seems to do the opposite from the judiciary's perspective. It opens up a lot of doors that are not not there now. I think you're pretty clear in whether I like it or don't like it. It's, you're clear and that, that's hopeful. I'm, I think the particular concern that I heard from victims was not about somebody that's sentenced July 1 of 2022, somebody who was sentenced July 1 of 2022. 18 for a rather heinous crime and is now after all of that process that the victims went through some victims feel re-victimized by the fact that this individual is now eligible to get time off of his sentence or her sentence between now and whenever that minimum comes up that's what i'm hearing as the egregious problem and because of, of the sentences that have already been imposed. Right. So I did not hear, um, although I might now, but I didn't really hear about somebody who in the future might be sentenced for one of these crimes. Because by then you will know what the rules of the game are. Do you have any reaction to that? Um, well, you know, I guess, Senator, I have to go back and, and look at some of my notes from the previous hearings. I, yeah. I understood that, um, and I know this goes back a while, so I, I'm not prepared for it today. It's actually but, September, I think. But. Well, <laughs> the, my memory is really faded um, yeah. with COVID. Um, I, I, I was under the impression that this particular bill, 
I, I thought I was in hearings where I understood the, the victims uh, advocates were, were supporting the bill in its then form. And so I've had to look back at now what is proposed in this legislation. I understand that issue um, and maybe revisiting that issue as opposed to uh, going, going forward. Um, you, you could leave the good time in place uh, for the offenses going forward. But then the, the issue really is what do you do with these eight or 10 offenses of people that had already been convicted? Um, and, and that may be the appropriate focus uh, for this bill. Um, but I would, I would have to give that part of it um, more thought. My, my concern, I don't want to say my concern. My, my the issue that the judges were responding to was a section six, which is talking about going forward, and so creating I, a new, um, a new yes process yes within the hearing about yes. whether or not the person right should be eligible for good time, and that jump with all the other decisions that the judge has to make in accepting right. the plea agreement. So setting aside that section six, which is going forward, I understand the committee's real struggle is with what do we do with this population that had already been sentenced under existing rules and then this, the good time provision came into effect. Um, I, I will revisit that issue um, and I'm glad to offer any- well, I think during the markup of the bill, certainly that would be one of the issues that we would explore. I, mean, I haven't heard from all the victims yet. And right. I think that we're next week or the week after, we're gonna try right. to hear from some of the folks who uh, either are victims or family members were murdered as part in the, how they feel about the way this um, new law has been thrust upon them. And I understand ultimately, even with section six, it's a policy decision on the part yeah. of the legislature. Right. So we're not advocating core cone one or another as opposed to- No, I understand that. Right. But I think the, <clears throat> the judges raise an important consideration is now you're adding a new element to the sentencing. Process. Right. <clears throat> and how we look at somebody next July versus how we might look at them 10 years later. Um, okay. As Senator, I think Senator White said, people do change. Okay. So I'll be glad to answer any questions committee members may have, but that's- Are, there, are there questions for Judge Gerson? Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Um, committee, this is, uh, time to, we, we are going to continue our testimony on this issue. Um, but keep in mind, as we talk about probation, next week, next Thursday, we're going to get a report from the Justice Center folks uh, regarding their work on justice reinvestment too, and specifically the probation sections. And Senator Nitker and I will be introducing a bill on probation that will be a little different than just credit. You'll hear more of that during that discussion. And I'm sorry to held Joe off on this for the week, but I appreciate his patience and waiting until Thursday. So um, I think once you hear the report, there'll be a better understanding. And I'd love, uh, love to see your, your proposal. And if you're looking for co sponsors, I may join you. Okay. Well, um, Bryn has that. And uh, Eric, if you could let Bryn know that. Um, yeah. Anyone, actually, okay. anyone's welcome to join in on the bill. We'll we'll talk about it on Thursday. I don't think it'll be introduced until after Thursday. But um, uh, we're going to, um, as I said, I may not be here Tuesday morning for the. I may be in for part of the meeting. They said to hold ninety minutes for this meeting with the. Uh, Person, so I'll, I'll do that. And uh, I believe we're taking up the competency issue, which we have several witnesses scheduled on that. Um, and Peggy's done a terrific job, as usual, on putting together an agenda for next week. Uh, 
I was surprised that the marijuana bill came here, um, frankly, and I'm glad to have Senator White pick a mark parts of that and take it into her committee. Um, but we will be taking that up sometime the week of the 20th, I think it's the 25th of January. We we are Michelle is coming in I believe on Tuesday to talk about the opt in opt out um, yeah. section and I don't know what other things in there that she thinks we should look at as opposed to judiciary. You're talking about S twenty five. Yes. I'm still trying to figure out how I ended up as the lead sponsor of that. Because your name is, is Betting, and my name is Sears, and Pearson's name is Pearson, and White's name is White. And Michelle said, how should I do this? And I said, just do it alphabetically. <laughs> Don't fight it, Joe. <laughs> I guess I should flag that for future purposes. <laughs> Maybe in the future you want to do it by reverse alphabetical <laughs> order. That would have made White the prime sponsor. Yeah. You know, needless to say, I'm I'm receiving some interesting flack from the uh, the right. I'm sure you are. Um, but you're able. I have thick skin and a thick skull. Yes. <laughs> so you also can have I, a Harley. Yep. Can I change the subject here just a little bit? Absolutely. I see. Um, Commissioner Baker isn't with us anymore, but um, <laughs> we took. Could you rephrase that, please? He's no longer online. He, he's no longer. On, he's no longer in the committee. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but the, on two on Wednesday or third Wednesday, our committee um, wrote a letter to um, as a committee. We all signed on to it. Wrote a a note to um, the administration and to the to Mike Smith asking them to um, put the corrections facilities, both the inmates and the staff, higher on the list of priorities for vaccines. You, which committee did that? Government operations. Okay. Um, because we, 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 we don't- We scheduled for next Friday <laughs> the same issue. Oh, okay. well, I, I think it's good if they hear it from two separate yeah, committees. Uh, I yeah. guess that's fine, but yeah. Well, we uh, just did it because we, we were supposed to hear from the deputy secretary or deputy commissioner or whatever uh, today, but she was not available today, but has agreed to meet with us next Friday to go over the issue of uh, those prisoners as well as prison staff, as well as judicial. Um, and maybe we should change that term, Peggy, on the agenda. Um, it's really the judicial uh, staff and others who are in the judicial system. And I know mm -hmm. maybe Eric can help you with how that should look. Yep. But and I, we didn't deal with that judiciary system at all. Just ours was just around. Yeah, but if, if, if the, the issue was how do you get back to handling mm -hmm. And I think Joe raised the issue until there's vaccination for the judges, the court reporters, the lawyers, the sector. How do you get back into um, holding jury trials? So Friday, we have civil trials that we're going to talk about and the impact of the delay on those, as well as the judicial um, and, and the uh, rollout of the vaccination. I'm getting a lot of calls about the vaccination. Don't know about the rest of you. Yeah. Calls and emails about vaccination roll up. Just from teachers. Well, I'm hearing it from citizens who are concerned that they're not getting the information and they see what New York is doing, what Florida is doing, and what other states are doing. The, the governor is on at 11 with a press conference talking about the next round of vaccinations. I'm well, so it's just 10 59 a.m. And unless there's somebody else who has a comment, maybe we should adjourn and go to the governor. We could listen in for half an hour until the floor. Yeah, I've got some work to do outside.